so it's New York School of, of Painting, uh, in particular Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko. John, next slide please. Um, and there's this thing about when you decide to look into history of any sort, it's like looking through a pinhole camera, that the potential for investigation is absolutely endless. Um, and I personally have known Rothko and uh, Pollock, I mean their work personally, for years and years and years. But when you set out to do this kind of presentation, um, you really don't know quite where to start. You know, from, from cave painting, ending with Cubism and Picasso through Cezanne, Piero, Giotto, Cimabue, Celtic work, Roman mosaics, etc. Next slide. Um, myself, uh, I had, was very fortunate I had an art teacher when I was about 11 or 12 who introduced me to a very particular kind of non cliche, i.e. not Michelangelo, not Leonardo, not, not Monet, but Stanley Spencer with his very quirky images and that uh, gave birth within me to a love of painting and the investigation of, of what images mean. Next slide. Um, I studied art for A-level and in the um, Jota de Cezanne textbook that we all use for A-level, there were all these tiny little um, postage stamp sizes of, of classical paintings and it's funny what catches your eye to, to, to engage you in, in painting and art um, particularly at an age when maybe you haven't been to the galleries dragged around by your mum and dad or whatever but there are two particular images that always I, I went back to um, Caravaggio's Supper de Maos which you can see in the National Gallery and Giorgione's uh, The Tempest I don't know why but they just caught my eye and engaged me um, Obviously, you know, one's got the greats, Leonardo, Michelangelo, all the, all the Venetian artists and whatever. Um, Caravaggio, I think, is, his popular, popularity has absolutely grown. But Giorgione is a very private um, Venetian artist who you see mainly in Venice. You don't see his work anywhere else particularly that I know of. Next slide. Um, so t tonight it's about abstract expressionism. Um, in the 40s and 50s, um, and obviously you've got Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko's paintings, but there are many, many uh, artists that one could have talked about, but obviously I want to talk about people that are close to my heart. Next slide. Um, but modernity, this is a really key part, and this is brief from uh, watching Robert Hughes' The Shock of the New. The sort of 30, 30 35 years before the start of the, second, the First World War, the uh, evolution of technology was absolutely phenomenal and this is the beginning of modernity. Um, the Eiffel Tower was the biggest building in the world in, in hype terms at that time so the public could go up and, and be as if they were in an aeroplane. They'd never been able to do that before unless they were a, a virgin in a cathedral or something like that but a hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of people at the, at the World Fair in Paris could experience that. Bottom row, uh, Henry Ford's production line from being the elite vehicle, uh, suddenly he was mass producing the Model T Ford and made it affordable for everybody. Um, the, the, the start of flight, um, which in 1903 to 1909, blurry crossing the channel for the first time. Obviously very challenging um, crossing the water. Freud's interpretation of dreams. Um, uh, and so it goes on. I mean, really, I mean, obviously, um, amazingly, Einstein's theory of relativity, which going from the First World War to the Second World War is a horrendous link there. Um, and obviously Mary Curie's uh, discovery of radium was the beginning of that process. Next slide. <coughs> um, so abstract expression is known as action painting, colour field painting or gestural abstraction. Um, and for those of you who've seen the work, it's very much about the surface... Um, the, the technique, the incredible passions conveyed in the way different artists paint. Um, and and for, for the school, uh, there are four particular influences. Picasso and Cubism, obviously, because uh, I think he's recognised as arguably the greatest artist of the last hundred years. So that could be a very good dinner time uh, argument with lots of red wine. Um, Kandinsky, who... I've, I've always known about Kandinsky, but I've, I've read more about him now, and he's truly fascinating. Um, 
starting his, his, his investigation into abstraction at about the same time as Cubism. Uh, Dada, the, the response to, 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 to World War I, seen as anti-art, they weren't really into, into painting, it was more about literature and, and um, uh, collage, <coughs> and surrealism, which of course uh, the, 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 the Freudian understanding or, or, or trying to understand the human mind uh, was a very, very important part in um, moving away from romantic painting into trying to look at the abstract of how we think and see things. Please, next slide. Um, so, in terms of modern painting, Cezanne took Impressionism, which was, was the investigation of light, back into the solid. Um, his, his way of interpreting solids was very, very beautiful, very, uh, very grounded, so very different from, say, Monet's paintings. And, of course, then Picasso took that on into Cubism uh, with, with, with Georges Braque. Um, and, and Picasso's painting was a reflection of, of, the, of the large pa um, bathers uh, Cezanne painting. That, the Picasso's Les, 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 Dam les Demos are d'Avignon, which was the, seems to be the first cubic painting. And in here you can see the influence of, of African and primitive art, um, as well as classical figures. Both stunning pictures. And Georges Braque was... Uh, he, he was less uh, inventive than Picasso. He, he kind of kept kept to, to to the root, but Picasso took it on and on and on. Carry on. Um, so Kandinsky, um, he had this amazing brain that could remember anything he saw, anything he smelled, anything he touched, um, and it was part of his of his uh, philosophy to, to to try and get beyond the normal human frame of mind. Uh, he, he was he was a sub he, was, he believed in the idea of theosophy, which I called it kitsch, that's why I put it in, in inverted commas. But it sort of meant that, that by being spiritual you could be in touch with God. Um, and it was looking to having a new kind of world, um, which which uh, was not temporal. Um, so at that bullet point, this meant a special art to suit the special times to come. I.e., how do you find a way of expressing yourself through through that thinking? Um, and uh, that statement is that quotation is from him. Behind the matter, the creative spirit is often concealed within matter. Um, if you think of the time, you know, sort of uh, 1909, um, this was kind of madness speaking. You know, it, it was it was not not conventional uh, discussion, dialogue. Next slide. <clears throat> His paintings started off by being, as, it, as th this is a very early painting, the landscape near Mono, um, still had to be in touch with, with, with reality. He was pushing, as, as the Fauvists who were post-impressionists, using big areas of pure colour, but with that he was still uh, keeping it grounded so people could understand it. But you can see by 1913, He'd gone completely abstract, um, although you could probably find some literal images in there. Um, but it's an amazing uh, transition um, when, I mean, you'd think sort of people like, say, Ken Kesey on, on LSD in, in the 60s, he might have seen that kind of thing. But for a man in, in 1909 to, or 1913 to have that kind of vision was quite extraordinary. Obviously, Picasso was doing his stuff, the Cubists were doing their stuff. Um, so it, it was it was a an in interesting time. Next slide, and this is more, just more of his work, his images, uh, which are really quite stunning. And you can see where they head into surrealism uh, and all kinds of art. And I mean, if these had been painted in New York in the fifties, you could say they're paintings from New York in the fifties. It's so they're so advanced, they anticipate so much. Um, next slide, and then of course this happened. Um, modernism promised all kinds of things, you know, wealth, technology, flight, mass production, um, and it's, it, you know, we're still being conned by, by that, you know, through, through, through capitalism. Um, sorry, I've revealed my politics. Um, but I don't know whether any of you have been to, to, to the war graves in, in, in France. Uh, I went for the first time last summer, and they are truly shocking. Uh, I mean, one, one reads about um, lions being led by donkeys, one reads about all kinds of things, but I think the reality of the soup 
of northern France and Belgium where bone, blood, feces, mud, just all mixed into one substance and, and men had to fight and live in that for year, year after year. How do you come away from that? Um, this Henry Newbolt, Up, Up and Play the Game, which is so often quoted about, you know, come on boys, I've got a bruised leg, I can't possibly play football, but Up, Up and Play the Game, actually is from a poem which talked about the, 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 the breaking of, of, of the British red squares, you know, the, the way the, the, um, the, the British army fought. Um, and talks about the sand of the desert is sodden red with the wreck of a square that broke. Now, um, we, all, we only see images of, of, of the war in black and white, um, you know, just hor horrendously, someone's hand just lying there. So that was an absolute full stop or a tipping point for the way that Western culture thought about everything. Next slide. Um, one of the key responses to that uh, going back to the, the influences on, on painting and art with Dada. Um, the war artists were not allowed to show the, the horror of the trenches. Um, they, they were able to sort of paint the, the, the army, the, the, the hospitals and people behind the lines, but they were not to show um, blown up corpses and the like. Um, so that you know, it, it, if you think about um, counselling, counselling is there to reveal yourself. You talk about things that are that are deep in you to, to, to kind of relieve the pressure. There was nobody. There was no nothing that the state was doing to relieve the pressure. The myth of being of great sacrifice was what was being promoted, um, and so it took artists to to begin to address that. Um, and the Dada da scene in in, in in Zurich was one of those movements. Um, and uh, people moved away from France and Belgium to, to, to Switzerland because it was peaceful. Uh, and Catholic society, as the tradition with Paris in, in the 19th century, was where people communicated. Uh, and there was the, the one group created the Cabaret Voltaire, uh, where they invented the word Dada. Um, it was literary to start with, with, with some artists, but it was about poetry. It was also about events, having crazy theatre, um, like sort of action painting. I mean. Uh, sort of crazy theatre where people made silly, silly costumes and things. I mean, it was just a kind of madness, again, in response to the madness of the trenches. Next slide. Um, so Dada was, was, was not a style. It was an idea. It was a philosophy. Uh, you know, it wasn't a cubism. It wasn't impressionism. It wasn't thisism, thatism. Um, and... They had, to, they had to find a way of, of, of dealing with, with, with what had been witnessed. Um, a lot of the artists would have died in the trenches. Uh, and I've shown the Jean Arp uh, sculpture, Birds in an Aquarium, because if you think of, of, of Prussia, the, the, the Germanic war machine, and where it went into with the Bauhaus, this, this is a complete um, uh, opposite to that. You, you create a, a free-form, free-cut, with silly colours and call it birds in an aquarium. It absolutely represents what Dada stood for. Um, and I mean, the last bullet point is ironically, futurism in, 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 in Italy during the 19 teens, whatever you call them, during the war, praised war, praised the dynamic of war, praised speed, praised action. Uh, <coughs> So they were being crazy. They also had events happening in, in cafes and things with, with theatre. Um, and one of it was leading to communism and socialism. The other one was leading to fascism. And it's such an extraordinary contrast with the same activity. It's the danger of language, how you express yourself. One person hears it one way, another person hears it another way. Next slide. In Zurich, um, before, before it moves to Berlin, where it gets very political, uh, the... One phenomenal artist, Kurt Schwitters, who you may or may not know, um, he did this whole series of collages called Metz, and it's because one of the pieces of paper he found was from the Comrades und Privat Bank. Uh, and these are quite small pieces, but they're absolutely, dare I use the word, divine, Ian Sewell like darling. Um, but they are phenomenal uh, images, of uh, abstract images, of just found bits of paper which he arranges on a page. And, and makes makes art from them. He ended up living in the Lake District in England um, after uh, 
sometime in the 20s and 30s, I think. Um, but funnily enough, 20 years before this, Van Gogh had seen a rubbish dump in Paris, and he wrote to his brother just saying he'd seen the most amazing dynamic thing. Um, I mean, he's a genius, and he anticipated this in a funny way by writing about you know, the, the, the chaos, the anarchy of something like a rubbish dump. And of course, Marcel Duchamp, uh, we all know his fountain, which is the uh, bidet signed our nut. Um, but um, this was his version or his, his abuse of, of the Mona Lisa. Now, if you say that uh, in French, uh, uh, I'm trying to, I can't get the pronunciation. How's it go? Exactly. She got a hot ass translated. It's wonderful. Next slide. Um, so they moved to Berlin. Germany was a very violent place after the war. They'd lost the war in Versailles. They'd lost the war in the trenches. The, 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 the conflict between left and right was violent, political assassination. Uh, they basically, the, you know, the, 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 left, the left wanted a, a revolution like Russia. Um, and you know, that, that, that line, with, with, with that sort of political heat, dropping bits of paper from bus tickets and things maybe wasn't quite the way to be expressing your, your passion, your anger. Um, so uh, it became a different movement in, 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 in Berlin. Um, and again, that, that quotation, life appears as a simultaneous muddle of noises, colours and spiritual rhythms, which is taken unmodified with all the sensational screams and fevers of its reckless everyday psyche and will all, uh, and will all its beautiful reality the great rebellion of artistic movements. Um, that kind of sums up the chaos that they saw in German society at that time. Next slide. Um, they used collage. Uh, they didn't see painting as, 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 a, as a vehicle to convey their political thinking. Uh, the Max Ernst murdering aeroplane is quite extraordinary. It's the sort of flattened French landscape of, of the trenches with a small group of soldiers maybe being strafed by, by the aeroplane. And the aeroplane, this modified thing, has the torso of a woman forming the main body. I mean, the irony of that is just extraordinary. I mean, su such a creative image. Uh, uh, it's, it's really fantastic. John Harfield was probably the most political of the Dadaists. He dealt purely in, 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 in collage. Uh, these are obviously from, from sort of quite quite late, but if you go online and look at Hartfield's work, it is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I mean, how how he survived National Socialism, making these kinds of images. Uh, I think probably he was living in Switzerland, which is how he did it. Um, but again, you know, the title of the picture, Adolf the Superman swallows gold and spouts junk, speaks for itself. I've shown images of all the artists because it's nice to see a face. Go on. Um, other other um, Dadis, this woman Hannah Hoch, uh, she she made very sensitive collages, but again it's sensitive. But this is incredibly sensual, um, you know, pretty maiden. It's a vehicle, and but these are almost like a woman with her legs apart, you know, and the hair, the wig, and 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 the symbols of BMW, whatever. Um, very political. Uh, very beautiful, but that's the thing. I mean, horrible stories make beautiful art and make you think about it. Uh, and there were two great painters, illustrators, George Gross, who uh, looked at Berlin society in particular uh, and just recognised it for what it was. I mean, the, the, the film Cabaret is all about that. You know, the anti-Semitism, uh, prostitution, the wealth of the, of the wealthy and the poverty of the impoverished. Uh, and the next slide shows you Otto Dix, who is uh, just, again, another phenomenal artist. Um, I mean, these two absolutely slap you in the face. There's nothing aesthetic about them except the aesthetic of beautifully made pictures. Just phenomenal. Um, there was a recent exhibition at Tate Britain called about war, war painting. And one of the artists had, had gone to the military hospitals and did literal portraits of the soldiers with damaged faces. This is, a, this is a satirical view of it, but actually 
the faces for real are just like that. With the trenches and mechanised warfare, there were more facial wounds and also the use of shrapnel and shells that, that men were just blown apart but not killed. Uh, and this reflects what, what war veterans were like. Um, Otto Dix has got another painting, I think it's here, was it gross, of a man, a match seller in Berlin, sitting in a street without any hands. I mean, it just goes on and on. That's the response to, 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 to the Great War. Next slide. <clears throat> so surrealism, I mean, goodness me, it just goes on. You know, there's this desire to find an alternative kind of sanity. Where is sanity? Um, the word is uh, coined by Guillaume Apollinaire, uh, and it was describing, in fact, three years before the surrealism started, a, a ballet parade, which was um, the Ballet Russe, uh, Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, uh, uh, music by Eric Satie and designed by um, uh, Jean Cocteau. Um, and he coined this, this, he couldn't believe what he saw, Apollinaire, so he called it above, you know, above on reality, surreality. Excuse me, I didn't get the E acute there. I beg your pardon, everybody. Uh, and it's a question of how, uh, with, with Freudian thinking, it was a question of how one can find liberty, how one can find freedom. You know, the whole thing about cancelling, about understanding yourself, is about trying to be liberated from your ghosts. Um, and uh, one thing I read is that they, they knew all about Freud, but Freud probably didn't give a hoot about them, um, although he, they were illustrating maybe his thinking. Uh, and Max Ernst came from Dada into Surrealism, uh, still using collage, as you can see there. Next slide. Um, and then we come to, to the, 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 the first major Surrealist painter. And he was very influenced by the Romantic painting of the 19th century in Europe. Um, uh, there's the guy, um, Caspar David Friedrich. And this guy, Arnold Brodkin, but in particular Brodkin, he did these paintings based on the, uh, along, along the Italian coastline of ruins and very grand romantic uh, images with, with sort of figures just floating in them. And uh, it's kind of, you can see it being a pre surrealist painting. Go on to the next slide. Um, and with the clarity of, of the ruins and things that he painted, um, De Chirico. In, in his travels as a young man, you know, took, took on board what he was seeing. And at one particular time, he, he went to T Turin. And with the arcade, I don't know whether you know arcade and Italian cities. I, I know Bologna well, but Turin is the same. They are really quite beautiful. Uh, and in the strong sunlight, he had this absolute clarity of uh, uh, the, the kind of r romantic structure of it the dreamlike quality of it, the bright sunlight on the stone. Um, and this, this inspired him to start to make these paintings. And there are a lot of paintings like this. He kept using the subject time and again. You know, the sort of mystery of, of the shadow of the, of the Colossus or whatever around the corner. Um, you know, the empty space. Uh, it, you can see it is surreal. You know, it's not, it, you could never experience anything like that. It's like a dream. Next slide. And then Max Ernst's paintings, who went from collage into painting. Well, you can't really begin to explain those. Next slide. Uh, and then we come to, uh, how do you say that? Is it Juan? It is Juan. I mean, I'm looking for you there. For, that's too many cowboy films, I think. Uh, Juan Miro, um, who just, his, his work Again, when you begin to look at it, as I've done in preparing this talk, we all know our different surrealists. You know, Dali. You know, we all know Dali. Da da da. Um, but this guy is is phenomenal in his anticipation of of of, um, of what was going to be developed in, in New York. Carry on. Um, this, these are early paintings of his. He he's grew up in in uh, in, he's a, well, in Catalonia. Is it Catalonia? Um, and funnily enough, he was so powerful, he a bit like Picasso, he was so powerful that the Surrealists joined him rather than him joining them. Uh, this is a very early painting of the farm where he grew up. And then you can just see a couple of years later, it's a similar subject, uh, but just where, where his mind is taking his work. The paintings begin to be very flat, begin to have uh, no, no particular light source. Uh, and this, takes, this begins to take you in, into where abstract expression 
expressionism got to carry on. Um, again, just some of his fabulous paintings. I mean, they're they're mysterious, they're joyful, they're colourful. Um, I mean, it's you know it's interesting the way he's using drip drip paint there, which obviously uh, Pollock came to many many years later. And so we go to New York. Um, next slide. Abstract expression just covers such a wide range of artists, like any movement, everyone's an individual. Um, here they've got um, de Kooning's not, not so abstract figurative paintings, which are, I don't know if you've ever seen these, but they're quite phenomenal. They're all very big canvases. And Barnett Newman, who has the most sublime, um, not always monochromatic, but very, very simple, rigid geometry, very long paintings. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, the, the one of the things about abstract expressionism uh, is is that it, it challenged the idea of, of a framed European painting, um, and in particular, the word synthetic cubism is used, and that's that's the sort of um, high cubism after all the, all the busyness of, of it being created got to a very simple analysis of, of plane, of surface, uh, with Picasso's drawings, uh, his drawing as he made a painting. Um, and uh, the, the, between that and, 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 and the surreal idea of, of, of getting into the psyche, it began to open the doors for, for, for the expressions to think about their own way of painting. Next slide. Um, again, this is a quotation from Charles Harrison, who's, who I've been reading for this talk. A remarkable conjunction of technical and ideological radicalism, which marks a moment of true revolution in the history of art. I think, my belief is that abstract expressionism is the first American art movement that is originally American. From the end of the 19th century, right through until the beginning of abstract expressionism, the Americans were looking to Europe to compete with Europe. They weren't better than, they weren't different from. Um, and I think that's a completely astute comment. It's like blues music. Blues music is a completely original musical form. There'd be, never been music like that before, unless you look to the primitive music of, of Africa and the like that came over with, this, with the slaves. Um, and that's why it's such an exciting thing. It's a whole new way of seeing. Next slide. Um, so, the influences in New York. Cubism and surrealism. You see, this is the cubist thing, the flat surface, but it's framed. Um, this is um, Arshil uh, Gorky. This is called um, Dutch interior. There's actually a, a Flemish painting of, of a man with a lute and whatever. Uh, this is a completely wonderful, humorous abstraction of that painting. Uh, Matisse, the master, who we, we haven't touched on, but he is one of the greats. Uh, and Fernand Léger, who maybe is less popular, but no less significant because of his work. Um, so it's flat light, shape and colour, hard edges, but box-like, you know, very contained still you know, within a frame. And you, you, see, you see pictures like this, they could have these kind of classical um, Beaux-Arts gold frames, as if they're not even modern paintings. You know, the sort of understanding of, of where this painting was in Europe was, well, it's a painting put on a wall, but it has to hang in a gallery in a formal way. America just broke away from that. Next slide. Um, so in New York, there were two particular guys teaching, um, Hans Hoffman and Ashil Gorky, um, both Jewish, uh, which I think is very significant because so many creatives in, in America are, are, are from Jewish backgrounds. Um, and he taught Pollock as, as, as when he just first went to art school. And he'd, he'd worked in, I mean, you can see his age, he was much older than anybody else. He'd, he'd seen it all. You know, even the Vienna Secession, Fauvism, Cubism, Kandinsky's abstraction. And he came to New York with that knowledge uh, in 1933. So he, he's quite a long time in Europe. And he came as, as a, as a, to get away from National Socialism. And Gorky. Um, <clears throat> arrived very early in America, and he had to go through, like any art student, every process under the sun to find his own language. Um, so he tried this, he tried that, he tried the other. But ultimately, 
uh, phenomenally, next slide, he came out and, and found himself. Hoffman's pictures were still very European in terms of dealing in composition, the relationship of colour. There is no line there per se, but he was very obsessed with uh, the, the sort of lack of freedom. He needed to compose, he needed to think about one colour against another, and, 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 uh, and um, so as I say, it's not spontaneous. Stunning pictures, but they weren't, they hadn't broken the boundaries. Next slide. Gorky, on the other hand, having gone through, um, we all know what it's like if, if you're a painter trying to find your, your own language. Um, you know, we all emulate the people we, we respect, copy the people we respect, and hopefully we, we, we get to somewhere where we find ourselves. These pictures reflect uh, that, I think, very well. Um, and lead very well in, into the kind of um, s sort of surrealist pictures the early abstract expressionists painted. Next, next slide. So we come to, come to the guys themselves. It's, it's been a long intro, but f for me, very important to get the context. Um, Pollock was, was born in, 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 in southwest Amer uh, states of America, came to New York when he was 30 because his two older brothers were painters who'd come to New York. Um, so he arrived, uh, whatever age he was, 22, was it? I don't know. What's, what's my maths doing? 28. Um, and Rothko was born in, born in, in Latvia, um, called Marcus Roth, 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 Uh And he changed his name down to Mark Rothko because he was concerned about anti-Semitism, which is a bit, a bit ironic. It reflects the time, but um, the USA was the one place that opened its arms to, to the Jews. Um, you know, they were expelled from every bloody country in Europe, exterminated, persecuted, and whatever. Um, and it, it, the reason why there's the relationship between America and, and Israel today is that initial, uh, initial opening of the doors to, to them as, as a race, as a faith. Um, so you, you kind of wonder about that. Obviously, it wasn't conveyed. Um, uh, Pollock died in a road accident. He was an alcoholic. Um, and Rothko killed himself, aged 67. Next slide. So when Pollock got to New York, he, he was fascinated, obviously, with, with the galleries, the old masters he could see. Um, <coughs> and uh, we all have to start somewhere. He worked with, with the Latin American uh, muralists, learning a lot about paint and painting technique and the like. Um, I have got any illustration of their work. But this is an early Rothko. You can see it's it's kind of it's a bit Samuel Palmerish if you know Samuel Palmer, you know the the, the, the moon, the sky, the the, the deers is quite sort of bucolic, um, but quite dark as well. Um, and it, he was several things happened. Uh, he he ran out of ran out of money and work, and he he. he he, he was taken on by the, work, the Progress Administration's Federal Art Project, works pro, known as the WPA. Now, in blues music, there's a lot of reference to WPA because it was a way, of, as it was the Roosevelt New Deal providing labor for people of all different skills. And you, you go around the, the post offices throughout the United States, you'll see these huge, incredible murals by artists who were commissioned on, on the WPA to paint in effect, social realist paintings. That's deeply ironic, because Stalin was commissioning Russian painters to do exactly the same thing. Uh, so it's pure propaganda. You know, America the free, land of the free, da 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 They were doing just the same thing. They were trying to tell people how great we are by, by these, these, these public paintings. Um, he was also having Jungian psychoanalysis, uh, and that's about, the, the Jungian psych psychology is about the ego, the personal unconsciousness, the collective unconsciousness. I, I am what I am, I am what I am, but I don't know what I am, and society is what it is, and it doesn't know what it is. Uh, it's a real fuck up, excuse me. But you know, it's that kind of understanding the mess, the melting pot of our psyche and what we are. Next slide. Um, He's very influenced by, by Native American painting. Um, and it's extraordinary, that picture, because it, it's a bit like an altarpiece. Um, Again, you can feel him trying to find his way, the marks he's making, the wildness of it. You can feel he's trying to find his way. Um, but in 43, he meets Hans Hoffman, uh, who's been teaching in New York for 10 years by that time. 
uh, and the WPA ends, so he has to find work, and he gets a job uh, at the Museum of Non-Objective Painting, which was the, the early days of the Guggenheim Gallery. So he got to know Peggy Guggenheim, um, and he also had his first solo exhibition that year. Uh, and the Guggenheim uh, meeting led to uh, the next picture, which is next slide, um, which is the mural. Now, because I've taken images off, off Google and, and whatever, uh, the large paintings that aren't, aren't very clear. So with all these pictures, I've, I've, I've actually, from a, a book on Rothko, I've taken this image, which is better from my camera, from my telephone camera, and shown the subject of, 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 of the main work. But this was uh, commissioned for her hallway in her apartment. And Duchamp said to Peggy that she sh he should paint it on canvas, not on the wall, because it's more flexible. You can move it. It has value. It can be sold, I guess. Um, so this was his first big painting, his first big statement of, of, his, new, of his new self. Next slide. Um, now, this is in the context, obviously, of uh, Picasso uh, and, 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 the, and the Cubist influence. Um, so, in that quotation, it is, there's an overlaying compatibility between the consequences of the persistent Cubist influence and the consequences of involvement in surrealist strategies for freeing conscious control over procedures of composition, i.e., you've got to find this from within yourself. Don't look at it and compose it. Feel it here and, and make, make a picture. Next slide. Um, so this is, these are the um, rings of the tree, if you like, between an early Rothko 42, similar to the one you saw before, through the mural. Uh, another picture which is quite structured to the beginnings of, of, of the sort of drip painting Sounds in the Grass, which is a whole series of, of pictures. Uh, but you can see incredible change over, over four years. Next slide. This is the man. Um, interesting reading about, about him. If you, if you paint on canvas, you have a brush, and you can see in some old paintings after they're quite long brushes and whatever, but with this need for space, this need to express yourself, and Ian McKeever talked about this three weeks ago when he was here as well, he starts his paintings on the floor, his big pictures, um, and the expression of, of, to describe Rothko that I've used is swings from the hips. He needs the whole body movement to find the way to, 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 to throw the paint, to lay the paint onto the canvas. Um, and you can see it's a whole different expression um, between something which is very tight and, and constrained to something which is completely expressive. Next slide. So again, um, we're kind of getting to the end of end of Pollock, but just look at a, a number of images of his. Um, these, are, these run in date sequence, but just the, the, the phenomenal depth of these pictures. I mean, they are overwhelming when you see them, the, the big paintings, because you're probably in a gallery situation with a lot of people around you, uh, and Rothko talks about this relationship between the, you know, the spectator and, and the painting. If you're being jostled by 15 or 20 people looking at one picture, how do you get into it? And believe me, if you have the chance to see a Rothko, look at it close up and look at it from far away. If you look at a Monet, look at it close up and look at it far away. It's the same relationship between the intimacy and, and the general. Carry on. Again, uh, Full Fathom 5, what a fantastic name for a painting. All on the canvas with nails, tacks, buttons, key, coins, cigarettes, matches, etc. I didn't try and find them, but... Uh, but you can see that the, the dynamic. I don't know if you find these beautiful. I find them absolutely stunning. Carry on. Next one. Just incredible. You know, chance is a big thing, you know, as we said. I mean, the, the, the way you throw, the way you make a mark, do you pick up the grey paint, the, the, the orange paint, the yellow paint? Uh, is, you know, how much do you cover the canvas? A lot of his. A lot of his drip paintings, there's hardly any marks. It's just raw, raw canvas with just a few, like a sketch. Um, Tracy Emmons does drawings like that. Tracy Emmons does stitch, stitch drawings where she uses needlework to draw a nude, and it's very similar. I mean, the links in art, as I said, when you, it's like looking through a keyhole. Where does it begin? Where does it end? It just goes on forever. The relationships. 
carry on. Breathtaking. Next one. I think this is the last slide. Croaking movement. This is, to my mind, of, of the images I've chosen, maybe the least successful, but that's my, my subjectivity. Um, you can see the, you know, the use of sticks and whatever to, to scrape the paint. It's very, very thick. But if you look at people like Frank Auerbach and Bomberg, you begin to see where artists can build layer and layer and layer of paint and, and make it work by pushing the paint around the surface. Next one. Oh, yeah. This is stunning. The blue poles. Again, it's just mind-blowing. Next one. So, goodbye to Jackson. Hello to Mark. Um, on we go. 836 paintings on canvas. An unbelievable amount of work. Um, and that quote, he, he's painted, Gulf connect with and transport the viewer to another realm, another dimension, freeing the spirit from the confines of everyday stress. You might think it's hooey. I don't. Uh, I've seen a lot of Rothko exhibitions and I've never been disappointed. I always come away energised. They're just fantastic. Next slide. Um, anyway, he, he comes to New York and works in, in the Garment District, which is you know, such a famous, cliched part of, 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 of Manhattan. Um, and he goes, you know, he sees people drawing, doing life classes, and he finds a school where, where Gorky's, uh, Gorky's teaching. He finds them too, too dominating. They didn't get on. It's too bossy, whatever. And then he, he went to another school with, where Max Weber was teaching. Uh, and <clears throat> that released him into to seeing art as a tool of emotional and religious expression. Uh, although subtext of that is his father died and he spent a year going to synagogue to, to, to mourn for him correctly. But it made him completely sick of, 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 of his faith in that sense. Uh, but in a way opened him up to a much wider spiritualism. Um, next slide. Early painting, nothing, nothing remarkable. Uh, I mean, when you think of, of Cezanne's Grand Bathers or Picasso's Cubist, it's not, it's not interesting painting. It's interesting because it's Rothko, um, and we all have to start somewhere. Next slide. Again, uh, an early exhibition. You can see him beginning to find things. You know, this kind of reflects like Ruhr, the black and white drawing. This is a bit Matisse or Darin-like. Uh, this is a bit Cezanne-like in trying to just look at blocks of colour. But they're not particularly great works, but they are him moving forward, doing things. Okay, next slide. These begin to really interest me. Uh, he did a series of pictures of the kind of stuffy urban life of New York. Um, and when you go to retrospectives, these are generally the earlier paintings which they show, because these these really do have uh, a quality to them, using the structure of the, of the of the subway to frame people who are quite androgynous, uh, are just kind of sitting there, all as symbols. Again, they could almost be like a uh, an icon, you know, an altarpiece, where the figures are symbols of, of people. They're not real people at all. Um, and uh, it is, uh, the, the first paragraph is interesting. They formed a group called Ten, although there were only eight of them. Um, and they wanted to protest against the reputed equivalence of American painting and literal painting. And that's my point. They were looking to be different from Europe. The convention in, in, in America was if it's not like a European painting, then it can't have worth, can't have value. Um, and they were desperate to get it to, to break away. Next slide. So they've, you know, again, trying different things, just like Gorky. Surrealism, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't bear looking at, except it's, it, it's, it's, it's one step further on through the process of his thinking. Um, yeah, there was an exhibition which you know, all these Europeans came and showed, and they thought they were going to be part of the, you know, like the Europe avant-garde. They were still identifying with Europe, still wanting to be like Europe. Next slide. Again. 
but the inspiration from mythology, there's this thing about you know where, where does where does man sit in in, in the universe, um, and this is where you get to sort of Nietzschean philosophy, uh, the birth of tragedy, um, and again this comment with um, with the world war going on, you know, like 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 um, Schwitters in, in in Zurich. Painting everyday scenes, you know, a vase of flowers or a scene in a kitchen. What relevance when the world's at war? Uh, you need a different way of, of, of expressing what's happening. Um, so these are, you know, these again are interesting paintings, but they begin to get close to his philosophy about about the, the, the aloneness of man uh, and, and how man has to stand up. Next slide. So. Um, the transitional period um, started with these soft, soft blocks of colour, and and the the human figure just disappears from the paintings, um, and it's to remove any obstacle between the painting and the viewer, using shimmering colour to to prepossess one's visual field, um, and this is about pure transcendence. There's no subject there; it's just about your, your innermost, or potentially your innermost thoughts. We've, we have new grandchildren and we talk about what do babies who don't have language think about? You know, people like Picasso talk about painting like a child. Roscoe taught children for 20 years because he, he believed in them. Um, there is this thing about, about absolute innocence, um, absolute vulnerability. Next slide. <coughs> This is quoting him, this human figure alone in a moment of utter immobility served as the prototype for the paintings of Rothko's final signature style. So these are, these are deeply spiritual paintings, I believe. More than, more than Pollock, I think. Carry on. Um, so that kind of speaks for itself. Carry on. And again... He went from bright, vibrant colours, <laughs> this is just what I've read, to the darker blues and green tones, probably as a growing dissatisfaction with his personal life. Um, so there goes my statement about the innocence of, of, of his mental state. Um, but we all know from music and music we listen to, we're happy, we're sad, we're in love, we've fallen out of love. Yeah, you're going to do something which responds to that, that state. Next slide. Um, so I've just taken details of, of the paintings just to look at, almost as if you're in a gallery. If you have a chance to, to see Rothko, um, they, they can be very dark or they can be very joyful and very light. But every time you need to look close and, and look at them far away because they, they have so much in them. Um, so this is the same about in, in using thin, thin layers of, of pigment onto the, directly onto the canvas. Uh, and it just makes up these translucent layers. The reason why they're thin is that it lets you see the layer beneath, beneath the uppermost layer. Um, the forms consist purely of colour. There's no drawing there, per se. There's no line. Um, and there's no frame. So again, conceptually, you can, you can look at the painting beyond the frame. Next slide. Again, just phenomenal. Um, I guess one, one com comparison that comes to mind is say, stained glass in, in Gothic cathedrals in France where you know, there's very, very dark blues that hardly let the light through. Um, things that just, just speak on, on a, on a, on a non-literal plane, just fantastic. Next slide. Um, I wrote that. <laughs> you know, they encourage contemplation and meditative state. Um, they really do have this ability to, to draw you in. Um, you look, look at the sort of depth in that line. You're, you're looking through to infinity there between these, these two, two um, blocks of paint. Quite incredible. Um, but it's a flat plane, but it's, it has depth, and that reflects one's psychology as well. There we go. Next slide. This is... Um, this is him speaking. The picture lives by companionship, expanding and quickening in the eyes of the sensitive observer. 
<coughs> it dies by the same token. It is therefore risky to send it out into the world. How often it must be impaired by the eyes of the unfeeling and the cruelty of the impotent. He was incredibly possessive about his paintings, how they were hung, where they were hung. He took absolute control of, of that. Um, and as he says, he's not interested in the relationships between form and colour. The only thing I care about is basic emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, destiny. Next slide. So he, he, he achieved incredible fame. He got three major commissions. Uh, the painting of the Four Seasons Restaurant in the Seagram building, which was a Mies van der Rohe a modernist icon, iconic building in New York. Um, very significant building in the history of architecture. Uh, the Holyoke Centre at Harvard University, which um, was just an important, very big commission. And then the paintings for the Rothko Chapel, where a building was commissioned uh, to hang his paintings. Next slide. Um, the Seagram, the Four Seasons Restaurant. Um, that's a quotation. Anybody who will eat that kind of food for those kinds of prices will never look at the painting of mine. He went to see the restaurant and was absolutely horrified. I don't know why he was surprised at being Manhattan. Horrified by the wealth, the splendor, uh, the indulgence of it. In his mind's eye, he thought he was painting for sort of a, a working man's cafe, a working person's cafe. Um, uh, and he was horrified by this. Next slide. Um, and his response, because he was still working on, on the commission, was he wanted to to base his pictures on the, on the Laurentian Library um, foyer space in, in, in the li for the library in, in Florence. And again, he, wa he, want he wanted the rich bastards to feel they're trapped in a room where all the doors and windows are bricked up. I mean, that's a really good response for a painter to a site, or for a designer to a site. Or for and this is the plan of, of that space. It is the most phenomenal, mannerist bit of architecture where the walls come out, the things that are carrying the walls are columns are pushed back in it's this all, all the way around and it's very small space relatively and then the library when you go up the stairs through is just this serene big space classical space but it's Michelangelo at his greatest <coughs> and you can see it being a um, an inspiration for him um, for his work next picture but he resigned the commission paid back the fee and after four years of negotiation with the Tate Gallery, he gave, because he also loved Turner, he donated the pictures to, to the Tate Gallery in Britain. And sorry about the quality of the slide, but again, if, if you're in London, you can go to Tate Britain. It's, 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 it's a really good place to, to make what I would call a pilgrimage, because uh, they are truly phenomenal paintings. Next slide. Um, they're very dark. Um, they stop you in your tracks. A lot of people I know hate them, think they're absolutely vile, boring. Why, why did he bother? Um, but if you're of the, of the right frame of mind and uh, um, are open to this kind of thing, then they're, next slide, they're very, very worth looking at. Um, I mean, it's like a bit of Beethoven or something. I mean, it's just... It just strikes an incredible chord. Next slide. Um, and again. But to see them in one space, to be surrounded by them in one space, is really very moving. Um, I'm not preaching now. Next slide. And then the Holyoke Center. He insisted that this, this large work was hung in a very bright sunlit area and the, and the paint just disappeared. So um, Harvard now use a projector to project images on the wall of where the paintings are. The paintings are down in a cellar somewhere. So they, they, they've created the paintings with light. Um, and again, it's the same big, serious, earnest story. Next slide. And then we go on to the Rothko Chapel, which was... Uh, Philip Johnson was the first of the architects to to struggle with Rothko about the plan. It was commissioned for his paintings, there are 14 paintings. And this is a space which is, it is non-denominational. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a place, it's a spiritual place for all kinds of uh, humanitarian human, uh, activities with great uh, humanity. 
uh, a, place, a place for peace. Next slide. Um, you know, if you're looking for an altarpiece, a triptych, I mean, it, I mean, uh, talking now, that comes. What comes to mind is uh, Giotto preaching to the birds, which you go in the, the door of the main basilica in a CC turn hard left and hard left. It's just behind the door. It's got this beautiful dark blue ground with this simple image of, of, of St. Francis just holding his hand out to the birds. Stunning. And that's, to me, again, is just a very deep, profound note. Next slide. The last paintings he did, I think, before he died, were these extraordinary dark pictures, sort of black and white. And the last big Rothko show at the Hayward Gallery in London they, they were really unsettling because they didn't draw you in. They were the paintings of, of, a, of, a, of a deeply disturbed person. Um, you, you know, to, to use a cliche, he kind of lost his mojo. Um, and in fact, this, the, the, the chapel was opened a year after he'd killed himself. Um, and in fact, the, 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 that's, the year of, of him killing himself was, was actually, I think, just about the time when the Seagram paintings came to London. So it was an incredibly um, sort of critical, crisis, climactic period for him, finishing major work, putting major work where he wanted it to be. Uh, but I think he was just a spent force, you know, after all those paintings. I don't think he had anything else to say. Next slide. So, to end on a lighter note, um, just... The joyful paintings, the less serious, the less dark. Um, I think I think they're phenomenal. I mean, to, to have that many paintings from one artist is incredible. Um, huge arguments in the art world, more of a fine art, who thought they controlled all Rothko's paintings. A huge financial battle between the Rothko estate and more of a fine art um, to, for, for the estate to get to get ownership of his paintings back. Um, but I think I think at one time his pictures, one of his paintings, sold for forty-four million dollars, which at that time was a record in the auction rooms in America. So that's my story.